The brethren that are speaking here on last Sabbath, I spoke to a group of virtually 3,000 or 2,800 of our people up at Stockton on the day of Pentecost, which was the next day or last Sunday. And on next Sabbath, God willing, I hope to be speaking to a still larger group of our brethren, and we expect about 5,000 in Cincinnati, Ohio. Uh, we should perhaps find our largest, largest audience of any, in any local center like that, outside of the Feast of Tabernacles in Cincinnati. Uh, we're expecting it to be a larger crowd than we had in either Big Sandy, where we had a very large crowd, or Chicago, or New York. And uh, as long as God is willing and gives me the strength, I expect to continue just about every other week, if I'm not traveling abroad or somewhere, to uh, be speaking to groups in other parts of this country and Canada. Now, I had a telephone call last night uh, from my executive assistant, Bob Fay who is in Manila in the Philippines. I had had to send Mr. Fay and Gerald Waterhouse over there, and we had also asked uh, uh, Mr. Why can't I think of our own people's names uh, from Canada, who was the former pastor in the Philippines, to fly on over there and join them. We'd had a little trouble, and we were getting a little static from certain local elders. There seemed to be a division forming in the church in the Philippines. Now, brethren, the Apostle Paul was inspired to say that we must all speak the same thing. We must be together. There can be no division in the church of God. So immediately I sent them over there. And we know that the trouble in the world is people get to looking at people. People can deal with things, but they can't deal with people. And so it seems that they look to other people, and they can't get along with them, and this and that and the other thing happens. Very often it's only a misunderstanding, and misunderstandings will develop feelings. Now, our brethren are trained to look to Christ. He is the head of the church. And that, that is how we remain together. We all speak the same thing, but it must be the thing that Christ speaks. He is the head of the church. And when we take our eyes off of Christ, we're like Peter. Christ was walking on the water on the... Uh, Sea of Galilee, and Peter and some of the apostles were in a boat, and Christ came walking on the water toward them. Well, Peter wanted to try it. Christ told him, well, come on. Come on and walk. And he did, and lo and behold, Peter was walking on the water, and it seemed like the water was holding him like a firm piece of ground or a pavement under him. That is, for just a moment or so. And then, you know what happened? He took his eyes off of Jesus. And as soon as he took his eyes off of Jesus and looked down at the water, he began to sink. Now, that is the trouble to many of us. As soon as we just forget a little bit and take our eyes off of Christ, the first thing we know, we begin to sink and we get into trouble. Well, I had very good news. Bob told me last night, they got over there, they prayed, and they had the former minister and the present minister get together. They said, now you two get together, and you pray about it, and you discuss this thing and see where we stand, and remember that Christ is the head of the church. 
So they went out and left those two alone, and they got together. As soon as they got their eye on Christ, they quit sinking, they began to walk on the water. And the waters weren't troubled any longer. Now we found that there was nothing but a sort of a misunderstanding. Neither minister had done wrong. The one minister has been transferred to Canada, the other is in the Philippines, and it merely needed to get our eyes on Christ a little bit. And any of us can make that mistake of getting our eyes off of Christ and getting it on troubled waters. I just wanted to say that because that has happened in the last two or three days. When our eyes are on Christ, and as long as we please Christ, we have peace, the church goes ahead, we are prospered, and Christ blesses this church and this work. Now, the church was not being blessed. For 35 years, this church did go along at an increase in membership in, well, just about everything, in uh, uh, the amount of radio time and even getting up into the beginning of television in number of churches and in income at the rate of 30% every year over the year before. That means we were doubling our size and the impact of our power and growth every two and approximately two-thirds years. We were multiplying our size and the impact of our efforts eight times in eight years and 64 times in just 16 years. I don't know of any record like that in any organization, any society, or even in commercial business in a company. Most businesses, if you notice, in the commercial world, they stand about the same place year after year until they finally fold up or go bankrupt or quit. The average store, the average business is no bigger today than it was five years, ten years ago. But the work of God cannot stand still. We must go ahead. And for about twelve years this work was not going ahead. Thank God he didn't want it to go backwards. But it still did not go ahead. And between two and three years ago, I found this church was sadly off the track, and I have been working very hard to get it back on the track. And we are back on the track. Now, I'm glad to tell you that the I just had a report yesterday afternoon late that uh, the income for this month is already going up somewhere around, let me see what it is, I think it's around 40% so far. And uh, for the year, it's 22% is climbing up. It looks like we may make up to 30% this year over the last year and get back on the track once again. It is over 30% in Canada. It is over 30% in Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, England, Germany, and many other places around the world. The one factor, more than anything we do, is a matter of whether or not we are pleasing Jesus Christ. He's not only the head of the church, he's not human. He is divine. He is God. He is the one who has the power. If we have any power, it's only power that comes from him and power that he gives us. Let us remember that. Let's keep our eyes on Christ. Let's keep him in our lives every moment of every day. I want to speak along that line today. I want to say, though, that the most important new knowledge that God has revealed and has come into the church in years is the clear understanding of the incident of the forbidden fruit back in the Garden of Eden. I've been speaking quite a little on that subject, and I thought yesterday, well, what will I speak about now this Sabbath? I said, well, the brethren will get worried. They'll say, well, is Mr. Armstrong going to harp on that same question all the time? 
Well, I decided you better I am. We haven't exhausted that subject at all. We haven't begun with it yet. I haven't exhausted this new understanding that has been recently be revealed, and so we'll continue until we do. Brethren, what if Adam had taken of the tree of life? I wonder if you realize what that would have meant. You'd be living in a totally different world today. If Adam had taken the tree of life instead of the uh, taking to himself the tr fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, let me tell you, we wouldn't have the system of education we have in our schools, colleges, and universities today at all. We would have a far different and a far better one. And we might even find parents teaching their own children anyway, which we might find would have been a much better way. We wouldn't have the system of commerce and business we have in this world today at all. It wouldn't be anything like it is today. You know there wouldn't be any tobacco industry today if Adam had taken the tree of life? Do you know there wouldn't be any medical profession today and all the doctors and nurses? are at work with something that they'd be doing something more profitable if Adam had taken of the tree of life. Do you realize how important that decision was that Adam made at that time? Do you know we wouldn't have the kind of governments in this world we have? We wouldn't have the kind of politics that we have? The people blaming the government for everything, they want to get everything from the government. And the government wants to get everything from us, doesn't it? It's all the same. Everything is get, get from everybody else. No, we wouldn't have this kind of government. We wouldn't have the kind of society we have. And we wouldn't have the kind of sports that we have. We wouldn't have the kind of amusements and entertainments we have. You wouldn't, you wouldn't have this kind of a life at all. Now, I'm going to say something about that later, because God has called us out of this kind of life. And I think we don't understand or realize that fully, and many of us have not come out of this kind of life. We're still part of it. And God says, come out of her, my people. Well, brethren, when are we going to do it? Yes, what if Adam had taken of the tree of life? Well, let's begin all over again, because there's an awful lot more to say on this subject. It means everything in our lives, everything. The whole world would have been different. Now we have to realize that, the God, that God is the source of our existence, such as we have, and God is the source of life. And God is the Creator. And God is creating righteous perfect spiritual character in separate entities that he has created. Of course, he created angels first. I won't need to go back into that today. But he created man. Now, what about God? We read of John in, uh, read of God in John, the first chapter, the first four verses. And we find two personages mentioned there. In the beginning was the Word. Now, the Word was a personage. The Word was with God. And God is a personage, so you have the two personages. Even the same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, the Word. But in verse 14, we read that the Word was made flesh ultimately. That was only about 1900, let's see, 50, 60, 70, 80 years ago. But uh, at that time, God became the Father and the Word became the Son. But in Genesis 1 and verse 1, we read in the beginning, Elohim. The Hebrew word was Elohim, meaning more than one person, but forming one God. Now, they're not two gods, they're two personages. 
but they form God. Now, God is not a person. God is a family. And God is consisting of more than one person. God is reproducing himself. It is a family reproducing itself and adding to the family. I am the father of a family. I've become the father of four children, and now grandchildren and even a few great-grandchildren. By reproduction, a family will grow and grow and grow. And Adam's family did grow until it has become billions of people on earth today, about four billion now. And if you take all of the other billions that have lived in the past years, there are a great many billion that have lived since Adam. And so we find that in the beginning was God, and God is more than one person. The Hebrew word is Elohim, and Elohim is a uniplural meaning more than one person, and that simply included the one who was God and the one who was the Word. And they have, since Christ was born, become the Father and the Son, but they are both God. And God is a family, and God is not one person. And you and I should have been already begotten into that family. And we shall, if we overcome, if we are filled with the Spirit of God, if we grow in knowledge and in character in faith, in spiritual character, and endure unto the end, we shall also become members of the God family. We shall be God in the sense that we're part of the God family, the same as the Father is and the Son is now. And so God said, Let us make man in our image. Genesis 1, 26. After our likeness. Not let me, let us. There was more than one person involved in Elohim. But God did not make man as he had made angels or as God was composed. God is a spirit. John 4, verse 24. All right. We've got, uh, uh, John, is it 4? John 3, 24. Did I get that mixed up or didn't I? Anyway, God is composed of spirit. He did not form man out of spirit. He formed man out of the dust of the ground. And so in Genesis 2 and verse 7, we read, that, and the eternal God formed man out of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. What was formed out of the ground became a soul. A soul came out of the ground. Therefore, a soul is matter and not spirit. A soul is matter and not spirit. Now, let me give you first now, it's very necessary at this point that we understand something I haven't been bringing out quite as thoroughly as I would like to. What is the difference between animal and man? If you go back just a few verses, in the 24th verse of Genesis 1, God said, Let the earth bring forth the living creature, or land animals, after his kind, cattle, and the creeping things, and the beasts of the earth after his kind. So God made the beasts of the earth after his kind, cattle after the cattle kind, and so on. Each animal reproduces after its kind, dogs after the dog kind, elephants after the elephant kind. But he said, let us make man after the God kind. Man was made after the God kind, and man is different from animals. Now then, I want to take a little bit of time this afternoon to get into this matter of what is the difference between an animal and a man. Man is not an animal. The educators are trying to tell us that man is only the highest of the animals in the process of evolution. Man is not an animal. Not an animal at all. There's a great difference. 
Now, animals have brains. Animals have eyes like humans do. Animals have ears to hear with. Some of their hearing is much better than human hearing, too, let me tell you. And animals have mouths, and they can eat, and they can taste food like we can. They can smell. And animals have a sense of feel through nerves. Now, so does man. And the only way that knowledge can enter through a man, into a man's mind, is through the eye, the ear, the nose, the mouth, the sense of taste, or the sense of feel and touch. He's not different from an animal in that respect. He is different from an animal in the fact he's made in the form and shape of God. Let me give you one illustration. The hands of a man. No animal has anything like human hands. Look at what human hands make. I have a watch here. It keeps just virtually perfect time. Human hands make this. I have another watch. It was handmade, not machine-made. But even hands made the machine. What animal could make a computer? What animal could form and make a watch out of matter? No animal could do that with hoofs or claws or, uh, or paws or whatever an animal has. They don't have a human hand. No animal could play a harp or a piano or a violin. Just think of what the human hand could do. An animal couldn't even operate a typewriter like we can, and I, I, I do a great deal of that myself because I do my own writing on a typewriter, all the writing that you read from me. Now, an animal has a brain, and a human has a brain, but there's a great, vast difference. Humans are made in the image of form and shape of God. God has hands, and God has feet and toes. Animals don't. We're in a different form and shape than animals. We're made out of the same substance as animals. We get the same kind of life as animals, by the circulation of blood and by a heart pumping blood and by the breath of air. So do animals. What is the difference? Well, in that respect, none, but there's a difference in form and shape. And an animal cannot do what a man can because it doesn't have hands. It cannot do what a man can because it doesn't have a mind. It has a brain. Now we come to another difference between man and animal. And let me show you something. For example, did you ever see a little calf born? If you lived on a farm in the country you have. I was not brought up in the country, but I had cousins about my age that were, and aunts and uncles, and we visited them down the farm quite often. And I've seen a calf born, and I've also seen babies born. I've seen four of my, uh, three of my four children born, and I'll tell you quite a difference. When I saw a calf born, it was able in less than five minutes, it might have been two, three, four minutes to get up on its four legs and walk. I've seen babies born, and they don't learn to walk for about a year. Look at the difference. Now, I saw the calf as soon as it was on its feet. In less, less than five minutes, it began to walk, and it knew where to go, and it knew what to do. <coughs> it went for its dinner. And its stupid old cow mother just stood there stupidly by instinct waiting for the newborn calf to go for his dinner. I saw one movie one time where the calf was going to the wrong end for the dinner and the mother just looked around and shoved it back to the right end. That was a real funny movie. But it was caught in action, not, not trained. It just happened that way. Anyway, <clears throat> there is a difference. Now, a newborn human doesn't know how to go for his dinner. 
A calf doesn't have to be told how to suck on the, the, the on, on the tits of the cow mother. It just knows how. By instinct. But humans are not equipped with instinct. Humans are equipped with mind. And the human has to be taught how to even suck its mother's breast. The human has to be taken care of. We have to put diapers on little humans for a while till we teach them how to go to the toilet for themselves. And that takes a little teaching. They have to learn everything, and everything they do has to be actuated by a mind. And an animal doesn't have that kind of mind. An animal can't think. It can be taught certain things by repetition. But it can't think, and humans can think even for themselves, but they need to be taught also. But humans have to be taken care of. Now the human has a mind to think with, an animal doesn't. An animal only has a brain, there's quite a difference. That is another difference between man and animal. Now I said that man was made to have a relationship with God but he was also made to have a relation with his fellows, with other humans. Man was equipped with what we call mind. Now, that originates in the brain. <clears throat> and the human brain is precisely like the animal brain. Now, the elephant, the whale, the dolphin, have larger brains than humans, and they're just as good in quality, and they're larger. But they can't think like a human. They don't have the mental output of a human. They can't reason. They can't think creatively. But they do have instinct, and they know automatically what they need to do. They take care of themselves. A human is helpless. He can't take care of himself. A little child has to have parents to take care of him or somebody. Because he's helpless, he can't take care of himself. Now, let me tell you something. There's another way in which we never, when we grow up, have been able to take care of ourselves. I'm coming to that. I want you to get this point. In the difference between man and animal. A man has a mind, and it takes time for that mind to grow and develop until he comes to maturity. A human being only comes to a sort of prematurity at about age 16 or 17. Until then, a child, a human child, only thinks about fun. That's all his life is, just having fun. That's what kids think about. But along about 16 or 17, they begin to think a little bit seriously about life for the first time. Now, that's only part of their thinking. That's not all of it. They don't suddenly change into thinking about serious adult things. But they begin to think part of the time about more adult things than about life. By 18, they begin to think a little more seriously about life. By uh, age 25, the average human has come to a place of maturity of mind where he's more or less mentally set in his ways. And after that, it's a little bit harder to begin to change his mind and change his ways. A human has not developed into the place, and I will speak now of the male sex primarily in this regard, where he is recognized by others as an adult and where he might have some leadership over others until age 30. And you will notice that Jesus did not start his ministry until he was about 30 years of age. Now those are just some things that I've noticed in life along the way about human development. The human mind has to be developed. The human body had to be developed from a tiny size of a pinpoint of an ovum fertilized by a male sperm from the body of our father. And it had to be fed on physical food out of the ground to grow into a material being made from the dust of the ground. 
and it has a mind. But what what gives man mind power when animals have the same kind of brain and something even larger and still can't think and reason like a human can? What then is the difference? Well, we turn over to one place, I'll tell you, in Job, the 32nd chapter and verse 8. There is a spirit in man. You can't find any place where the Bible says there is a spirit in animals, in a cow, or a turkey, or an elephant. But there is a spirit in man, and that spirit empowers the physical brain with materialistic intellect. And I say materialistic intellect because that's all it does. That's all it does. Man is made in the image, the form and shape of God, and man is made with a mind which an animal doesn't have. That is the way in which man is different from an animal. He has a mind like God. He's in the form and shape of God. He has hands, for example which an animal does not have. Man was made to have a relationship with God, but he was also made to have a relationship with his fellows, with his neighbors, with his children and other people's children, as the earth became populated. Now, God made man incomplete. God made man with a spirit. I'll go into more of that again, and I have before and before, and you should already know that. God made man with a spirit, but that spirit can't think. That spirit can't see. The human physical brain sees through the physical eye. It hears through the human physical ear. The spirit in man can't do the thinking. The physical brain thinks, but the spirit is like a computer. And what knowledge comes in with the brain through the eye, the ear, the nose, the mouth, the sense of feel and touch is instantly programmed into the brain, and I mean into the spirit. The spirit then is the, uh, contains the memory. And it gives instant recall, and that instant recall, the human brain puts together in a process we call reasoning and thinking, and an animal can't do that. That is a difference. But all that it can reason, and all that the human mind and brain naturally, as Adam was created, and as you and I were born, is to think about physical, material things. We can even think about people, but we don't know how to, how, how, how to conduct ourselves with people. We can't deal with people. We are made with a mind that can deal only intelligently with things and cannot deal intelligently with people. It was made to deal with God and to have a con contact and a connection with God. Animals were not. Now, I want you to get this difference. Man needed another spirit. He was made incomplete. And in his mind, man is mentally only half there. I have said that the most ignorant people on earth are the ones with the greatest education and the most PhDs or MDs or other doctor's degrees after their names. The more of this world's education you have, the more ignorant you are, because that education is 100% materialistic and physical. Because the human mind can't see spirit or spiritual things. It can't reason about spiritual things. And in our contact with God and our contact with neighbors, with other humans, we're dealing with spiritual equations, not merely with materialistic equations. We're dealing with spiritual principles. Now, that gives us some idea about the world that has been developed. Man needed another spirit. He's only half there mentally. Now, man was offered life through the Holy Spirit. If he had taken of the tree of life, 
he would have received life, but how does God impart life to human beings? God imparts life to human beings only through the Holy Spirit. Adam would not have had immortal life just bang right off like that. God created angels like that, and they did not make the right choice, the third of them. God was not going to let man have immortal life until man had already learned to live that life in the way that he could get along with other people and with God. He had to have a right relationship with his neighbors and with God. Now, all of our troubles come in dealing with other people, and because we can't deal with God, and they have not, uh, because men have lost all contact with God. They're cut off from God's wa wavelength, but they're on Satan's wavelength. Now, all the time, you have to remember that there was Satan on the throne of the world. And Adam was created in a manner that his mind was on Satan's wavelength, materialistically. It could have been on God's wavelength if he had taken of the tree of life. God offered it freely. Now, when the Holy Spirit comes, which would have happened to Adam, the first thing the Holy Spirit gives you is knowledge. The first thing the Holy Spirit does is to open your mind to the way of God, the way of life, your relationship toward God, your relationship toward neighbor. That is the law of God. The law of God is a way of life. And the law of God is outflowing love to God and to neighbor. And it's because we don't do that and don't have that, uh, uh, that ability to have that kind of love toward God and toward neighbor that mankind has had all of his problems and all of his troubles. Look at the world as it's developed. I'll go into that a little more in just a minute. But I, I, I want you to notice, man has been cut off from the ability and the power for a relationship with God and a relationship with his neighbor. Now, just as a newborn baby needs help from and guidance from a parent and teaching from a parent, so even an adult, an adult human needs teaching from and guidance from and help from God. And without it, he's helpless, especially in his problems which are spiritual in nature. He needs a contact with God. He needs guidance and help from God. For example, in, um, in, in Psalm 34 and uh, verse 19, Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord, the Eternal, or God, delivers him out of them all. We get into trouble, and we don't know how to get out of it. And the way to get out of it is we need the help of God. A little baby gets into trouble, and it needs the help of a parent. Now, just before I came out here this afternoon, there was a little boy who started running. He started running around here, right out here on the stage, and his father had to come running after him. He needed a little bit of help and guidance. So did you and I when we were that age. We have to have help and guidance. And God is not only one who guides us, but God is one who will help us when we get in trouble. And we need God to reach down and take hold of us and help us, just like a little child needs someone to put on his diapers and take him off and put on a clean pair and to feed it and to take care of it. And it needs the guidance of a parent or an older person. And all humans have needed that guidance from God. But when Adam took to himself the knowledge of good and evil, he took that to himself. Now, if he had taken of the tree of life, the first thing would have been a knowledge of the law of God, which is the way to good and to avoid evil. In other words, the first thing he would have gotten from the tree of life would have been spiritual as well as material knowledge. What did Adam take? He took to himself the knowledge. He didn't want to get it from God. He didn't want help from God. He says, I'll take care of myself. It's just like a little boy who said, I'll run out there. I'll take care of myself. I don't need a father to help me. 
And man is like that yet. He's a conceited great big ass. That's what he is. He thinks he can take care of himself. He says, God, get out of here. What are you trying to get from me? Get your nose out of my business, God. I, I don't want anything to do with you. When Adam made that choice, he cut himself off from God. And most humans have cut themselves off from God through sin ever since. Your sin has cut you off from God. And man is on Satan's wavelength, and all have sinned and been cut off from God. But when Adam made that choice, and instead of taking the Holy Spirit, which he would have had from God, that would have first given him knowledge of the spiritual law, the way of life, love toward God and love outgoing, outflowing toward neighbor. In other words, I help my neighbor, my neighbor helps me. We kind of help one another mutually. And if we get in trouble, we, we go to God. Now we had trouble over in the Philippines. What did we do? If people had tried to solve that by themselves, it would only have blown up into a bigger thing and the whole church over there would have been blown up by, this, by today. But no, we needed help. We went to God for it. God straightened it out right away and all is harmony and peace. And of course, they've had their service today long ago. As a matter of fact, when Mr. Uh, Faye called me last evening, our time, and we just did, as a matter of fact, it was during the Bible study, which I was looking at on my own television screen. Uh, whatever you do here, if I'm not here, I'm looking at you anyway at home. And uh, I've got my own television hookup, and I can see what was going on. But uh, anyway, uh, he was just getting ready to go for the afternoon service this afternoon already over in the Philippines, because it was already this afternoon over there when it was only last night here. And they were going to have a fine service, and all was going to be harmony. Why? Because we looked to God, and we had the help that we needed from Him. You can't live your life alone without God. Human beings are as helpless trying to get along without God as a little child is without a parent. I want you to get that comparison and realize it. Yes, many are our problems and troubles all through life, but we need the guidance of God, and He delivers out of all of our troubles. Now, life, that is, this tree of life, meant the Holy Spirit, of course. Now, it meant spiritual knowledge. Man doesn't have spiritual knowledge. He only has materialistic knowledge. All that can come through the material senses of the eye, the ear, the senses of smell, feel, and touch. Material knowledge. But his problems are spiritual in nature, and he has no knowledge of spiritual things. He would have received knowledge had he had the Holy Spirit. Then he would have received also the love of God shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. Now, once he received this knowledge of the law of God, that's the way of life. That's the knowledge that is the right knowledge of what is good and what is evil. And that way is fulfilled by love. Love is the fulfilling of the law, but that is the love of God shed abroad in our hearts for the Holy Spirit, and God would have given him that love, and that is God's love. It's not a love that Adam was born with. Adam didn't have that kind of love. And, and Adam says, I'll just manufacture my own knowledge. I'll manufacture my own love. I, will, I don't need faith in God or from God. I, I, I will have faith in myself. Self-confidence. Look, look what a great guy I am. Look what I can do. I'll go on my own power. He should have received faith, the faith of Christ from the Holy Spirit. He should have received power from God. The love of God to fulfill the law, he didn't get any of those things, so he couldn't fulfill the law of God. And when you break that law, you get in trouble. And man has been getting in nothing but trouble all these 6,000 years. Now, if he had taken of the tree of life, that meant taking to himself spiritual knowledge, spirit love from God, that flows right out from God, 
I don't know, then, if you were here for the morning service, you would have heard something about what is the Holy Spirit, if you had. And the Holy Spirit flows, and it flows from God into us. And that includes love, and it includes the faith of Christ. To give you the faith, you need to rely on God, and to go to God for the help when you need it, and to deliver you out of troubles and problems. I've written a booklet on the seven laws of success. The first is the right goal. But if you don't have the seventh, which I put only seventh in time order, but first in importance, which is contact with God, you won't even have the right goal. You'll have a wrong goal. But the second one, then, is knowledge, preparation for that goal. The third, since we're physical, was good health. And the fourth was the drive. Once you have the knowledge, then to push yourself on. Some people are just like a day ago. They don't, you know, they, they just take it easy, and uh, they uh, they don't drive themselves at all. If you get anywhere in this life, you have to really have to drive on yourself. Now the next was resourcefulness. The next are the laws of success. When you get in trouble, is the resourcefulness to find a way around. But man doesn't have that resourcefulness in his troubles. He needs to get that from God. And he needs guidance from God. When you get down to it, all these things he needs to get from God. I think now that I need to write that book on the seven laws of success all over again, I'll add a little something to it I didn't have in it. Finally, it is... Enduring to the end, in other words, sticking to it, endurance, tenacity, and just don't give up. Because just a little more, and it can turn what appears to be a hopeless failure into an overwhelming success. But you would get knowledge, love, faith, power, all of these attributes from God, that God would pour into the Holy Spirit. Now, it was explained in the sermon in the morning service of how God pours the Holy Spirit. He will pour it into us. It is like water. Jesus said, If any of you thirst, come to me and drink. And the man who thirsts out of his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. But it has to come first from God. It flows into him. Now, man has one spirit. But man is like an electric thing. Let me see. I have an electric light here. I don't know if you can see it or not, but there is a double wire coming in here. That they're joined together, but there are two wires there. Two wires coming in there. One electric wire alone wouldn't give us any light. You have to have a, a, a return circuit, and it takes two. Well, it takes the two spirits in man and also the love of God and the uh, faith uh, in God and in Christ. And all of that has to come from God, and then it flows back to him again on a return circuit. But man needed both, just like you can't get a light, you can't get electric power without the two. And man only has the one spirit. As an electricity, you have to have the two wires coming in. But man only has the one spirit until God gives him the Holy Spirit. Now, the other tree that was offered as, wasn't offered to Adam, God, God, can, uh, God forbade him to take it, was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And that was created, man creating his own knowledge with his carnal mind, with the one spirit, which limits him to spiritual knowledge. And he can't know anything about spiritual principles, about spiritual dealing with other people or with God. He needed the other spirit. All right, let's turn over now to 1 Corinthians 2 once again. I've gone into this before. Where Paul says, But as it is written, I has not seen nor ear heard, neither entered into the heart of men, or that is into the human mind, 
the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. In other words, spiritual knowledge cannot come through the eye or the ear or the sense of smell, taste, or feel. You can't see spirit, you can't hear it, you can't feel it. It doesn't vibrate, you can't hear it. You can't see it. It has no odor, you can't smell it. You can't taste it or feel it. And yet some people have a feeling of emotion and they think that's the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not a feeling. The Holy Spirit is not an emotion. Now sometimes, if you're filled with the Holy Spirit, there is an emotional content. And there ought to be. But that is minimal compared to what it really means in the way of enlightening the mind and giving you the love of God and the faith of Christ and the power and the things that you need and guidance from God. No, with your eye, your ear, the five senses, you can't know the spiritual things or the things of God or spiritual knowledge. You need even to deal with other people. But God hath revealed them unto us. But he's talking here to Christians in the church. God did not reveal it to Adam. He would have if Adam had taken the tree of life, but Adam didn't. Now then, God has revealed them to us by his Spirit, for the Spirit searches all things, yea, the deep things of God. The Holy Spirit is open to some of us now, and has been since Christ, but not, uh, uh, not after Adam had made the wrong choice. For what man knoweth the things of a man save the spirit of man that is in him? A man, well, say uh, uh, a chimpanzee, a dolphin. They're smart animal. An elephant, a whale. They cannot know the things a man knows. They don't have human knowledge because there's no spirit in them to impart that to them. They just have physical brain only. That's how man differs from animal. Now, even so, the things of God or spiritual knowledge that we need for a contact with God and a contact with our neighbors. That kind of knowledge knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. Except by the Spirit of God you cannot have that knowledge. And man doesn't have that knowledge. Our wisest men, our best educated men, do not have that knowledge. That knowledge is revealed through the Holy Spirit. Adam did not take that, uh, uh, that spirit, that tree that was offered to him. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, or spiritual knowledge. For they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned and revealed through the Holy Spirit which Adam would have had if he had taken it. Now, Adam did not take it. Adam chose the other tree. He chose to go it alone by himself. It's like a little child saying, I, I won't have any help from my parents. I'll just take care of everything myself. And man is helpless in his problems and his troubles and doesn't know why. So Adam took to self the knowledge of the right way and the wrong way, of what is the good and what is evil. Man decides what is righteousness and what is sin, and he decides the way. And uh, so man has materialistic knowledge only, and he's confined to materialistic knowledge. So he's able to deal with matter and with things, but not with people or with God. He's cut off, he's cut himself off from God. Now, he is helpless as a newborn baby, as I've said. To work with other people, to have peace, contentment, happiness of mind, and to have a contact with God. We read now in Romans 8 and verse 7. Romans 8 and verse 7. Because the carnal mind which Adam chose and which mankind has had ever since, 
The carnal mind is enmity against God. That is, hostile. Enmity means hostile or hostility toward God and against God. For it is not subject to the law of God, which is outflowing love to God and to neighbor, neither indeed can be. It just is not and cannot be. Now, the whole world has been cut off from God and from the knowledge to solve man's problems or to deal with one another. He's cut off from God and he can't even deal with his neighbor. That is the kind of world you've been born in. And people think this is God's world. And people think this is a pretty good world. Oh, they don't know how rotten it is. And they don't know how wonderful the world tomorrow will be when all of the people in it have a contact with God and have the Spirit of God so they can deal in harmony and peace and love with one another. And if when the misunderstanding comes, they both go to God and God straightens it right out, just like we straightened out in the last two days the situation over in the Philippine Islands. And we have churches all over the Philippines, there's a number of churches over there. So now we go back, and I've read it to you so many times before, but I want to go back once again the third chapter now of uh, uh, Genesis, in the last three verses. So the eternal God said, uh, Now lest the man put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever, and gain immortality and immortal life while he's going the wrong way and only has one spirit. And he's chosen to live his own way. Therefore, the eternal God sent him forth from the Garden of Eden, and he drove him out from the uh, uh, Garden. He placed at the east of the Garden of Eden cherubims and uh, a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life and prevent people from getting the tree of life. So God shut the spirit of life off from man. Now in God is life. In Christ the Word was life. Christ came, he had life in himself. He said, I am come that they might have life. So it remained for the second Adam to come and bring life. The first Adam failed. But Christ says, I have come that they might have life and have it more abundantly. The whole world then was cut off from God. It had some knowledge of God, but no spirit content or connection with God. Now, how has man's world developed since Adam? Let's just take a minute for that. For about 5,000 years, the world went along on a pretty even keel. Transportation had to be walking or on horseback or muleback or, an el or a, a, a camel. They had some elephants. Some of them do ride elephants, I guess, in some parts of the world. Or they would go by... Uh, a rowboat or a sailboat. There was very little knowledge. There was no printing. The only way that they could transmit anything by writing one to another was by writing out by hand. And the books had to be written. Just one book written one page at a time and one book. No printing. Just think of that. Education didn't develop. But they did develop a world cut off from God. And it was a world half illiterate and ignorant, half, almost half starvation, many starving, living in filth and squalor. Now, the last century and a half, the world seems to have awakened a little bit materialistically. And we come to the time of modern science and technology, modern education, and it's all since the printing press, when we've had more of a diffusion of knowledge, especially in the Western world. It didn't reach the old world of China very much, or India, or in many parts of Africa. It didn't even reach 
parts of South America. Now, man in the Western world has had what we look on as awesome progress in materialistic production. But everything that he thinks is great and awesome that man has done has been materialistic in dealing with matter. Man can deal with things. He can deal with things out of the earth, but he can't deal with people. Man has been able to even solve getting up out of the earth's atmosphere and going to the moon and back, and coming back without being burned up as he comes back through the atmosphere. But a man goes to the moon, comes back, and then breaks up his family because he can't get along with it. I don't know whether he's a wife or his children or something. The whole family is broken up and they're in trouble. Man has had great progress materialistically, but he has had nothing but retrogression when it comes to dealing with man and no connection with God. Even after Christ came, Christ came. Now, why did all this thing happen? Man cannot deal with people. He's out of contact with or help from the Creator, which he needed. Now, man has developed the hydrogen bomb. Man has developed the engines of destruction that can become the Frankenstein monster to destroy man. And now, it's a fearsome thing, and NBC... I believe it is, is going to have a program, and I, I didn't get the date, whether that's tonight, tomorrow night, Monday night, I, 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 I didn't catch, on if a hydrogen bomb hit Omaha, Nebraska, what would happen? And if you from Omaha, or from, we'll say, uh, Sioux City, Iowa, Des Moines, or Kansas City, they would all be affected if a hydrogen bomb hit Omaha. It's going to be a frightful thing, and they're going to show you with, uh, uh, well, with, uh, what am I trying to think of, the sort of illustrations that they have, they're not, not real, not real photographs, but, uh, uh, well, I can't think of the words in any way they're all manufactured, to show us what would happen. Uh, so now our number one problem is self-preservation, or can mankind even stay alive on the earth, or are we facing nothing but doom ahead? And here we are in a physical existence. We don't have life, we only have a temporary physical existence. I've been emphasizing that the last two or three weeks before. Only a physical existence and a physical existence where we're cut off from God, a physical existence where we're helpless to deal with one another, and where we only have a temporary life and it's going to end at the point that all men wants to die, and after this the judgment. Think of what is, what is the state of man today. But life came only by Christ, the second Adam. Now, now we get down to the time when life came by the second Adam. But Jesus said in Matthew uh, 16, and uh, verse 18, I think it is, Jesus said, I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Jesus said he would build his church, and he did. He revealed his truth to the apostles. And... On the day of Pentecost, after he had taught his apostles for three and a half years, and there were 120 there to follow him, on that day uh, something happened. Now, Joel, the prophet Joel had prophesied, Joel uh, 2.28, um, and it shall come to pass, this is a prophecy even... Uh, the main prophecy is ahead of us yet, but the prelim preliminary part happened 1950 years ago, 1950 years ago last Sunday. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my Spirit upon all flesh. Adam had rejected the Holy Spirit. God had shut off the Holy Spirit. Now, after all of these years, 
approximately over 4,000 years, God started the Holy Spirit for the few that were predestinated and called to be in the Church of God. And there were only 120 after three and a half years of Jesus preaching who were there on the day of Pentecost. And on that day, that day of Pentecost, I want you to notice, beginning with the first chapter of, uh, or the first uh, verse of chapter 2 of uh, the book of Acts. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, after Christ had ascended to heaven, they were all with one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. That's a real roar if you ever heard a, a wind rushing that way. It's a, uh, there's quite a lot of sound to it. I uh, happened to be uh, uh, back in Indianapolis, Indiana, uh, just a couple of three nights ago, and a hurricane came very close. You may have read about it or seen about it on television news, and it uh, played havoc uh, just a short distance, and there was terrible lightning right there in Indianapolis, uh, where we were eating up on the top floor of a, uh, uh, I don't know, 20 or 30-story hotel. Suddenly, there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. It was a real noisy uh, occasion. And uh, there appeared unto them, that's the 120 who were there, cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them. They say the Holy Spirit is a person, a Holy Ghost, because it's always spoken of as He. Oh, no, it's called It here. It is not a person. It sat upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. It should be, and it says ghost here. That wasn't the ghost that filled all of them at all. It was the Holy Spirit. Now, on the verse... Uh, uh, 15. A crowd came rushing in, and they wondered what had happened. And Peter stood up to talk to them. And Peter said, For these are not drunken, as you suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day, and nine o'clock in the morning. But this is that which was spoken of the prophet Joel, saying that it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, that I will pour out my Spirit upon all flesh. Now, this was only the preliminary, the first fruits. Not all flesh, but it was all flesh of those God had called at that time, just the church. And it was only 120 out of all of the population of the earth at that time. Now, later that same day, another 3,000 were baptized, however, and uh, undoubtedly received the Holy Spirit that same day. Now then, they listened to Peter in a sermon, and they were filled with consternation. And uh, when Peter had got through preaching, the people asked them what to do. And in verse 37, now when they heard that Peter speaking, they were uh, pricked in their hearts. And they said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? They were rather frantic when they heard, and, and heard how guilty they were of putting Christ to death. And now they wondered what to do. Then Peter said unto them, Repent, and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, what had been offered to Adam 4,000 years before. Now the Holy Spirit was opened up because the second Adam had come and paid the penalty with his life for the sins of those people who had sinned, and now they could repent and be reconciled to God the Father who had eternal life to give. He says, For the promise is unto you, to your children, and to all that are far off, as many as the Lord our God shall call. Just to those that God calls, 
Because Jesus said, No man can come to me except the Father would sent me draw him. But it's not for all flesh even yet. That was the first fruits of all flesh, and that only at that time. Now, Christ had preached his gospel. But as you read in Galatians, the first chapter of the gospel was suppressed, verses 6 and 7 of Galatians 1. The gospel was suppressed. But, and it had been suppressed then for 1900 years. Now, the true church of God had moved underground. And the true church of God, God continued generation after generation. But how did the church receive its knowledge? Originally, the church received its knowledge from the apostles, and the apostles got it direct from Christ. Now, Jesus is the Word of God in person. The Bible is the same Word of God in writing. The same Word, exactly. This is Jesus Christ in writing. The same Word, exactly, that he taught the apostles. No difference. Now then, we have a prophecy back here in Malachi, the third chapter, and the first five verses. Behold, I will send my messenger. It's a prophecy for the future. And he shall prepare the way before me, and the Lord, whom you seek, shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant, whom ye delight in. That's Christ, the messenger of the new covenant. Now go right on, the next verse. But who may abide the day of his coming? Who shall stand when he appeareth? He'll be like a refiner's fire and like fuller's soap. And he shall sit as a refiner and a purifier of silver. He shall purify the sons of Levi and purge them with gold and, as, as gold and silver that uh, they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. And then shall the offering of Judah and Jerusalem be pleasant unto the Lord as in the days of old. And I will come near to you to judgment. That does not describe the first coming of Christ. That's describing the second coming of Christ. John the Baptist was only a forerunner, preparing the way from the first coming of Christ. And as John the Baptist was a voice in the wilderness of the Jordan River, the physical, material wilderness of the Jordan River, preparing the way before a human, physical Christ, born of the human flesh, to come to his human people, Judah, and to come to his materialistic temple built of stone and wood and other materials, and coming to announce he would restore the kingdom of God, or build the kingdom of God and restore the government of God. So, it's speaking of the second coming of Christ, where there would be one prepare the way of Christ's coming by preparing the temple he's to come to, the temple is the church. You are that temple. And this would be a voice in the spiritual wilderness of the 20th century relig uh, religious confusion, crying out in that spiritual wilderness to prepare the way for the spiritual Christ in power and great glory to come to set up the kingdom of God and to come to his spiritual temple, the church, not a physical temple. And this time to set up and to establish the kingdom of God on earth. Brethren, we've come to that time. And God has raised up one, and you have heard the truth from him just as the early church heard the truth from the apostles. Now, where did, how did God give me the truth? I got it from the same Christ, only in print, that the original apostles did. I began to find that everything I had been taught religiously, which I never paid much attention to anyway, was contrary to the Word of God. But this was Christ speaking. 
I saw when he said the wages of sin is death, I'd been taught the wages of sin is eternal life instead of death, but in hell fire. I'd been taught I already had the gift of God, and the next part of that same verse said, but eternal life is the gift of God. Adam had, could have had it as a gift. He didn't. Nobody has had it as God's gift since, but Christ brought it as a gift through Christ, the gift of God. I began to learn we don't go to heaven. I began to learn that almost everything the churches are teaching today is false and contrary to the Bible. I began to realize that the Bible, I had to prove that God exists and that the Bible is the authentic Word of God and that it is the authority and the authoritative Word of God. I was taught, my mind was swept clean of every other belief, and I was taught right from the Bible, and I didn't get it from any college. I didn't get it from any uh, uh, seminary or Bible school, from other men. I didn't get it from other people. Now the second generation of the church got it from the people of the first generation. The, church, the third generation of the church got it from the second generation. Then they went underground, and people got it from people and the generation before them. And when I came into the church, I found they had lost about 90% of the truth of the gospel. Now, they did have the law of God. They did have the Sabbath day, but not the annual Sabbath. They didn't know about the kingdom of God, though. They only knew a little about the Holy Spirit. They knew there was a Holy Spirit, but, but they didn't understand it at all. They didn't know what it meant to really have the Holy Spirit. They were an arguing people. They could argue from certain Bible truths, but they only had a part of the Bible. God has revealed the truth to us in a way that nobody in 1900 years has ever had it. Do you realize that, brethren? Do you realize that the Methodist Church doesn't have it? The Roman Catholic Church doesn't understand it. The Presbyterian Church, the Baptist, none of these churches understand this truth. The thing that God has given us is as different as day is the night. And they are in darkness when it comes to the light of God. I'm not condemning them. God says the world is deceived, and Satan has deceived the whole world. And deceived people can be ever so honest. They don't know they're deceived. Maybe they mean well. I wouldn't criticize. But if God hasn't called them, he will later. This just isn't, isn't the time yet. But he's called some of us now. Judgment is on us now, though it isn't on them as yet. Now, the truth has been restored at last. We are in the end time. The church is the first fruits of the very Spirit of God. Now to the church. Let me show you what God says to us. And as I say, the church went underground, but it's been revived. The 18th chapter of Revelation. And after these things, the prophecy, I saw another angel come from heaven having the uh, great power, and the earth was lighted with his glory. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon, the great, is fallen, is fallen and is become the habitation of demons and the hold of every foul spirit and the cage for every unclean bird. And Babylon is shown in the 17th chapter as Babylon the great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth, a woman riding on a, the governments, on a number of governments. Babylon is a great false church. And she is the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. Protestants came out of her in protest. And we are called, come out of her, my people. That's out of Protestantism, out of Roman Catholic, Catholic, Catholic. Well, 
Catholicism, if I can say it. Um, I, I got a little twisted on that one. But uh, for all nations, now that all nations have been deceived, as you read in the 12th chapter of Revelation. All nations have been drunk with the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth have waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins, that you receive not of her plagues. And this is for this church now, just before the day of the Lord and the plagues of God were poured out, just before that time. Now, I would like to have you notice next. Let's see. Second Corinthians. Second Corinthians 6 and verses 16 to 18. For Christ says, For ye, speaking to us as a church, and especially in this last time, this last generation, um, for ye are the temple of the living God, as God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them of this world, and of their religions, and of the ways of this world, and the world's entertainment. What will you go home from this sermon, turn on radio and be entertained, or go to some entertainment tonight? God says, come out of them, my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord. And touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and I will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord of hosts. That is what God is saying to us in this last time, just before the final plague and before the precede the second coming of Christ. Now, we come over again to Second uh, uh, Peter uh, 3.18. Second Peter three eighteen. I didn't put a marker in for that. Well, Second Peter three eighteen says, to, "I know what it says. I'm not turning to it, but grow in grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ." We have to grow in that kind of knowledge. Adam took to himself knowledge, and we have to grow in the knowledge that God imparts through the Holy Spirit. Now, for our time, there is another prophecy back here in Joel, and Joel, the first chapter. And notice the first three verses. I want to read you a little of this prophecy. The word of the Eternal that came to Joel, the son of Pethuel. Hear this, ye old men. Give ear, all the inhabitants of the land. Hath this been in your days, or even in the days of your fathers? Tell ye your children of it, and let your children tell their children, and their children another generation. The prophecy for the far, far future. Now, turn to verse 14. Drop down to verse 14. Sanctify ye a fast, call a solemn assembly. Gather the, the elders and all the inhabitants of the land into the house of the Lord your God, and cry unto the Lord. Alas, for the day, for the day of the Lord is at hand. It hasn't come yet. No, the day of the Lord isn't here yet. The great tribulation isn't. And the day of the Lord will come to cut short the great tribulation. But it's at hand. The day of the Lord is at hand. And as a destruction from the Almighty shall it come. Now, in the second chapter of Joel, uh, well, I think that's the message for, for right now. It, it, it's, let's see. Now, in the second chapter, the 12th and 13th verses, 
Therefore also now, says the Eternal, turn ye even to me with your heart, all your heart, and with fasting and with weeping and with mourning. That's the message of this church now. Brethren, are we taking this lightly, or do we come here to be entertained this afternoon and then go out for more of the world's entertainment tonight? These things are real, and a terrible thing is coming on this earth. I don't know that an entire hydrogen bomb is going to strike Omaha. Maybe it'll strike Pasadena. But we're coming to the time when we need to be thinking about going to a place of safety for protection against the things that are coming. We're coming to her at a time when it says, Therefore also now, saith the Lord, Turn ye to me even with all your hearts, with fasting and with weeping and with mourning. Did we do that? No, we're taking it lightly, my brethren. I've been trying to get this church back on the track. We're not filled with the Holy Spirit like we should be. We're still too much in the world. We're still careless. I mean you and you and you and you and you and you up there in the balcony. You are careless. And you're in danger. And I'd like to see you get out of danger where you're safe and where you're under the protection of God. We just take it carelessly for granted. Well, we're a member of the church. God will take care of us. Don't kid yourself. You remember when Christ came right up against it, and he departed and prayed, and he even sweat blood? He was in such earnest. It wasn't an emotional fervor like Pentecostal people, just physical emotion. It was spiritual earnestness, and that's the way we've got to be now uh, toward life, and in our prayers, and in our Bible study. And we are not awake, brethren. We're asleep at the switch still. And I say, wake up. Some have been purged from the church. It's too bad. We hate to see it. But the church has to be cleaned up. But it's all in the second coming of Christ, the great tribulation. These things are near. We need our minds first on the Bible and on the things of God. I think we have our minds more on the picnic that's coming up than we do on the things of God and the serious things. The Holy Spirit is a mind that is not just filled with physical emotion, but it is a mind that is earnest. And it's in earnest about this condition in the world and that we're to come out of this world and be separated from it, and that we're to get closer to God than we are. Brother, we're not that close to God. In the last week, I've made arrangements to go back over to Jordan and renew acquaintance with King Hussein and renew a program that we had that we didn't go through with over there. And I wasn't responsible for that, but it'll all be taken care of. I don't know that Petra is a place of safety where we're to go. I don't know that. I know this, that if it is not, then the place is not revealed as yet in the Bible. And there is plenty of evidence that that could be the place. And King Hussein of Jordan controls it. And he is a friend of mine. And I need to renew that acquaintance. And someday you may find that my acquaintance with kings, presidents, prime ministers, and heads of state over the world may save your lives. We need to realize we're getting into the most serious days that this world has ever known. We're in a time when we need to watch and pray as Christ warned. 
And that warning wasn't from the generation of two or three generations ago. It wasn't for people 500 years or a thousand years ago. When Jesus said, watch and pray for you, know not the hour. He was talking about our time and our generation now. And we're not taking it seriously enough, brethren. We're taking it nonchalantly. Oh, yes, we're, we've got the truth. The other churches haven't got it. We're pretty cocky. We think we're pretty good. Or do we? We better quit thinking that, and we better get a little better and a little closer to God than we are. I hope you'll take this home to yourself and that you'll spend a little more time on your knees from now on. Thank you very much, brother. I'm in dead earnest about it. I didn't mean to entertain you to be applauded or for applause. This is very, very serious, so I hope you'll take it that way. Additional programs and literature available at hwalibrary.com.